Uh, welcome everyone to the latest installment of the EFF Austin Monthly Meetup. Uh, see old and new faces, welcome all, and to those of you watching online, welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Welch, I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. For those of you who are like, what is EFF Austin? Well, uh, we're Austin based, as you might guess, but we're a long-standing um, local digital sub liberties organization. Been around uh, over 30 years at this point. We collaborate closely with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. They are the nation's oldest and largest digital sub liberties advocacy group. You can kind of think of them as the uh, ACLU for the internet. They work to protect your rights in emerging technological spaces, especially your First Amendment rights to uh, free speech and your Fourth Amendment rights, which implicitly grant you a right to privacy. They protect all sorts of awesome things that uh, let uh, the internet and technology empower you to uh, have a good future and have your rights respected. They uh, fight for things like net neutrality, end-to-end um, -end encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, which is how social media can exist, and just do a lot of good stuff. They're awesome. You should get involved, give them money. If you're not based in Austin, there are many groups all around the country who work with them. In fact, there's a thing called the EFA, or the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is about 100 digital celebrities groups who all work in a form of kind of peer-to-peer -peer activism with the EFF. None of us have any formal legal affiliation. We just all kind of believe in the same values. EFF usually focuses on the national level while the various groups focus at city and state levels. Um, EFF Austin is proud to be the oldest member of the EFA. I think the second oldest is EF Georgia from 96, I believe. Um, we're the oldest and actually we are, as far as I know still to this point, we're not only the only one in Austin, we're the only one in Texas. So we have a lot of ground to cover and uh, I can promise you uh, there's many silly laws our lawmakers pass that we've tried to encourage them to do better on. Um, we um, most recently on that front, actually, with the last legislative session, we gave some feedback on uh, HB4, which was the big Texas data privacy law. Um, we basically, it wasn't so much a case of that we thought it was bad because it was better than the status quo, which was nothing, but uh, we didn't think it went far enough, basically. So um, I gave some uh, testimony on thoughts on how they could improve the bill. They ignored it, but we tried. We are proud of our success recently at the city level, where we were um, arguing with the city about returning uh, automated license plate readers without sufficient protections or oversight. While we weren't able to entirely kill the program, which would have been our uh, preferred outcome, Oh. Wow, wow. <laughs> I mean, clearly if there's a more fun party going on in there, you know, go check that out. Um, yeah, um, but I am happy to say while we weren't able to kill the program, which would have been our desired outcome, we were very happy uh, to basically win getting it. They wanted to keep the data from the license plate readers for a full 30 days. We got them down to seven days, so we were very happy about that. You know, small, small steps. Um, but the main thing we do primarily is educational at the moment. Uh, we have our monthly meetups, which are the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. They've been going on here at Capital Factory for over 10 years at this point, before my time. John, uh, who's here, can tell you when they actually started. But uh, we've been here a long time, very grateful to Capital Factory. Um, we've had a bunch of really incredible speakers on a bunch of topics over the years. Um, yeah, because, you know, we think... Uh, you know, if, if our lawmakers uh, can't understand a lot of this tech stuff to make wise laws, well, it's, we got to educate everybody because everybody elects the lawmakers. So that's, uh, that's how we try to do our part. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're entirely uh, community run. So get involved if you're passionate about these topics. We've also been known to occasionally throw very fun uh, cyberpunk parties when I can convince eccentric millionaires to do it. If you know any, please connect us. It's been a bit since we had one. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's a little bit about us. I guess um, I will quickly. Uh, yes, John. They don't have to be eccentric. Oh no, no, that's true. They they can be uh, they and they can completely politically disagree with us. You know, if they want to give us money, as long as there's no strings attached. <laughs> um, anyway, um, let's see. So normally I uh, I try to give you all a little preview of some of the things we have coming up over the next couple months before I turn things over to our speakers. So. Um, so next month, we're going to be having a virtual speaker. We're going to be beaming in Dave Moss, who's one of EFF's main investigative journalists and reporters. He's specifically going to be talking to us about uh, an issue that very much affects Texas. Um, you may not even know about this because it has not really made the news a lot, but it turns out that down uh, just across the border uh, in Mexico, in Juarez, uh, the Mexican government has built a 20-story tall giant surveillance tower that can potentially intercept communications as much as up to 100 miles away from the border with this tower. No warrants, of course. 
So Dave's going to be talking to us about what he's found about this tower, uh, so we can at least all maybe go yell about how the hell this happened. Um, also, uh, February, I'm very happy that we're going to be hearing from uh, Antonina Smivlova, I believe that's how you say her name, but, um, but she, uh, she's a tech lawyer, and specifically she's going to be talking to us, she's done a lot of academic research about um, basically how surveillance works in Moscow, basically, so we're going to be hearing from her about uh, how that all goes down. So, um, yeah, we, uh, those are the uh, next couple talks we have coming up. Should be a lot of fun. I recommend attending them. Um, if you know anybody who'd like to give a talk, um, by all means, uh, let us know. The rest of the calendar is open. Um, we're also in the early stages of planning an event in March that actually won't be part of South by Southwest. It'll happen after South by Southwest, but there's going to actually be some European members of Parliament being brought by a DC think tank to Austin. We're trying to put together a community event with them to talk to them about tech policy and how they could improve EU legislation, which if you follow it, the EU gets half their tech legislation way better than the US and the other half they get way worse. It's both very inspiring and very frustrating simultaneously. Um, yeah, so that's some of the stuff we have coming up. Um, I also encourage you all to uh, stick around after the talk. We usually go get a drink in the uh, hotel bar here, which will probably also double as this year's uh, holiday party because I've been on the job market and didn't have the bandwidth to put something more formal together. Um, so yeah, by the way, if you need a full stack web dev, I'm great and I'm available. So uh, without further ado, I think, so first of all, I'm gonna give our speakers a uh, bio here, but I'm also gonna let our friend and speaker um, um, and uh, just general cybersecurity person uh, here, Owen McNally, wants to say a few words about uh, Peter as well. So I will say my little thing, turn things over to him, and he'll turn things over to Peter. So uh, yeah, so um, so you know, I often feel very honored that we've had some pretty illustrious, famous uh, people speak with us over the years. Um, obviously, we've featured Cory Doctorow and Bruce Sterling at some of our events. Um, we recently um, featured Bruce Schneier, the famous security researcher. We've had a lot of pretty illustrious people over the years. And, um, Having to say we're continuing that trend, I'm very honored that uh, our speaker this month is Peter Wang. Um, for those who aren't in data science machine learning, Peter is a pretty big figure. He's the founder and CEO of Anaconda, which is one of the biggest data science platforms. They're up there with fast.ai of like, you know who they are if you work in this space. He's also a founder of the Pi Data open source data science movement. He's been a longtime advocate for open source software, starting with founding the Linux Users Group at Cornell in 1994. So OG Linux, it's like Fedora or something. <laughs> in recent years, he's been active in the internet privacy and decentralization movement, having given many talks at the WebCamp and serving on the board of the Center for Humane Technology. With the accelerated adoption of machine learning and AI systems, Peter's actively working on ensuring that the technology foundations of the future remain open to innovation and are oriented towards human thriving. Um, so yeah, so basically we asked Peter to just come and as a literal expert on machine learning and AI, give us some of his thoughts about how this is gonna impact digital deliveries, the good, the bad, and just where he sees this all going. Though before he speaks, I'm going to quickly let Owen say a few words since they are friends and I know he asked me to say a few words. Yeah, so I just, uh, Peter, thank you so much for doing this. We've been trying to get this together for months. We finally were able to coordinate uh, around everybody's schedules. I just wanted to say that um, of the people in Austin that I have met, I don't know that anyone has made me rethink computing and the idea that we were really fundamentally leaving the era of computing that we all grew up in, that, that we're leaving this behind. I just, um, it's re remarkable how challenging and how radical your interpretation of our situation is. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for coming. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, that's, a, that's a lot. That's a lot of. Um, I mean, put me up there with like Bruce Schneier and um, Cory Doctor and others is, is quite a compliment. I'm I'm deeply humbled by that, and I hope I don't disappoint these very lofty expectations that have been set for me and for those who are joining us um, off the interwebs. Um, one question, just as a procedural matter, is there a way to dim this row of lights just so there's a little more just contrast? Those. Or all of them so you guys fall asleep? Well, we'll and then, see I mean, whichever, I'm good. Let me ask Emily, or, or do we have that there? Is that brand new one? Yes, there we go. There we go. Okay, and now, all right, a hush settles over the crowd. So, um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I am the, the co founder and the CEO of Anaconda, and um, oh my God. Cursor go, um, and I realize this is a very interesting crowd um, to that I'm you know very very excited to, to speak to. Um, I'm going to touch on a few things which might 
get a little spicy, and hopefully that will um, engender some good conversations and questions afterwards. Um, so I think, and to Owen's point, I think we're at a, at a moment that is really, really important right now in computing. And, and um, I think many people here, in particular, in the EFF adjacent circles, remember the promise, the, the kind of abundant, utopic sort of promises of computing and what it could do for everyone. And then it certainly did not quite go that way. Um, and all of us, of course, have a great deal of disappointment, shame, and anger about this. And I think we might have a chance to fix it all, or not. So we're going to figure that out. But the point of this talk, this is, so again, I'm wearing this for those who came in late. I'm wearing this because I actually have a day job, which is to be the CEO of a venture-backed company and do all those things that, you know, kind of board and investor and senior executive meetings today. Um, but in my heart is a kid with a Slackware shirt, 1995, you know, plugging into 100 megabit, du full duplex 100 megabit Ethernet at Cornell, um, banging on Linux for the first time. So that's, you know, we never really, we sort of build in layers, right? So, so there's a, I won't say, I don't, I won't say I was ever cyberpunk, but, uh, but I was always just really into computers and what it could do for people, what it do, could do for me. So we're going to talk about that today. And I would just tee this up this way. There's two major scarcities that the last 50 years have been about, right? Um, and this is a weird way of looking at it to some extent. Because if you look at the PC revolution, <coughs> and when you look at the PC revolution, you're like, oh my god, PCs, bicycles for the mind, or whatever. And it's like, actually, no, turns out coding is kind of annoying and hard, and it requires a certain kind of cognition, which is systems, abstract, procedural abstraction, a kind of thinking that the vast majority of humans don't do naturally. So there was a scarcity of talent who could actually write code, and that is true of computers. And those of you who remember the old computer ads where they were on the kitchen counter and the wife in the apron was going to type up a basic program to catalog her recipes, you remember that bullshit, right? <laughs> that didn't happen. And so that's because this stuff is hard, okay? You know, 40, poke, 49, 168, comma, zero. That is hard. Um, and that's literally the most basic version of programming. The other scarcity is the internet revolution. And what it did was it created this unfortunate thing of bandwidth, um, the, the bandwidth scarcity around that, and the latency is high relative to the information of the space. You guys can do this. Bandwidth is scarce relative to the information space of what we want to query. Okay, this is a weird way to talk about the internet, because it was like, oh my god, telecommunications, fibers under the ocean, everyone can talk to everyone, everyone can access the blah blah blah, and also the other happy horse shit. No, actually what ends up happening is we realize how much we don't know, and how badly we want to get to all the possibility spaces, and humans are not good at interfacing the, uh, the, the, the scarcity solvers in our brain and the, the min-maxing optimization pattern matching in our brain is not good when it actually hits like three orders of magnitude greater abundance than it was designed to, to uh, solve for, hence diabetes. Even when we hit sugar, we don't you know, know what to do with that. This, we don't know what to do with. And so these are weird ways of looking at the last 50 years. That computers means that, you know, you do a lot of like interesting computation, but coding is hard. Internet means you get access to all sorts of stuff and talk to all sorts of people and do all this crap. But actually, the bandwidth is scarce compared to how much stuff you could get to. And Google, as the DNS in the sky um, for everything, they make a lot of money, basically, right? 40 billion a quarter because they are the gateway to that. And now what's interesting about this, the reason I bring these two up as scarcities is because this ability to turn what, what the LLMs and the recent kind of AI innovations have, have shown is that we're, we're basically eliminating that first scarcity because you can go from sketch to working prototype. It's not perfect, it, it's, you know, whatever. But the fact that it effing works at all is shocking, right? And here is a 40 billion parameter LLM on a USB drive. <laughs> So you don't need to go and raise $10 billion from Satya to basically have a little bit of fun. And now the bandwidth scarcity between you and all of the things you could like want to do with a lot of human information is eliminated. And so this is why I'm presenting this slide. Oh my god. No, please don't. Yeah, okay. It is a corporate machine. I'm doing deeply on corporate things, but this is a corporate machine. Um, so that's why I present it like this. 
And I think it's important to view this current moment of time in AI in the context of eliminating these two scarcities. And holy crap, what does that mean, right? And what I mean is this, and I know you all can read, but if you just think for a second, just close your eyes and just think for a second, everyone you know who knows how to code, everyone you know who works in tech, who you say is technical, everyone who knows how to configure a router, plug in something into something else, everyone who can go and like write a line of SQL, everyone who can actually write you know, a more complex Excel expression into the formula bar, Everybody that we could say is technical, in the sense of what a room full of EFF people would call technical, that's 4% of the global population. The other 96% get to eat what we dish out to them. And we make sure we get first dibs. We get the good jobs. We get all of the, the alpha and the growth and Wall Street. All of that comes through the productivity gains that we give to the world, right? Um, and the global IT industry on a just as an as a estimate, it's about $5 trillion, right? Good chunk of the, of the human international uh, GDP. But the problem is that the other 96% of people, not the problem, but the good news is the other 96% of people have a lot of good ideas, a lot of creativity. They're humans too. They can't write code for shit, but they're really, really cool people. And with AI, we can actually unleash all of that creative potential and all of that genius and all of that everything, right? So if we do that, can you imagine, right? Just do the math, 4%, you know? If you go and you increase the number of things that could be done with computers by a factor of, God, I don't even know what, 25, you know, whatever it is. It's just incredible to think about that. So this is what is about to happen. And people talk about GPU shortages. We, we're gonna have computer shortages. Once somebody on this, once anybody it says, oh, you know what? I can do my glass sculpture better with AI because it's going to give me all these crazy cool things. I can go and do my art better. I can go and optimize some other stuff better. I just need to buy a stack of 10 MacBook Pros. Whatever it might be, we are going to use computers a lot more. That's the, that's the bet. And the other thing is if you think about what this 4% of people have done as a extractive mechanism to, well, not extractive. That's, that's too harsh. The way we have structured, the way that the economic flows have structured the technology landscape is, is specialization into software components, architectures. Are you a software guy? Are you a hardware guy? Are you in, in cybersecurity? Are you in data science? Uh, what language do you use? What database systems do you deploy in the cloud? Are you on-prem? All of these divisions that we put into the technology space, they're all a pile of parts. And anybody who's on the buy side of technology, if any of you are CTOs or if any of you work uh, at a small firm or a big firm and you're trying to piece together a solution to build something, you're pulling a lot of parts together. It's like going to an auto zone about the state of like, I don't know, Michigan, and then trying to pull the parts together to build yourself a car. That's really annoying. It takes a lot of expertise. But we now have 3D printers, right? If every, you know, Bill and Jane can go 3D print a Ferrari, that complexity goes away. So this is really the interesting thing, the moment in time that we're at. And so if we actually want, if we see what the new world is that's about to happen, and we as a group of people are passionate and we care about certain human values in, in light of computing and whatnot, then it's important, I think, for us to not fail the way that we have failed over the last 30 years to stop the freight train and all the terrible shit, right? And the way we have to do that is we have to articulate North Stars. And I'm going to give some examples that might be controversial, might be a little spicy, but um, I will also then talk about what I think maybe we should think about for AI. Um, and, and I do think, and again, I've, I've you know, not been like part of big activist networks or whatever, but I certainly have been in the middle of tech watching big platforms happen, watching the internet capture happen, watching all these things happen to what we're uh, to, to really a, a, a landscape that was created by open protocols and open collaboration. Um, so, so for instance, decentralization, one example of how we articulate North Stars versus not, right? So if we talk about decentralization, I've been in the DWeb movement for a number of years, I'm passionate about this, so this is not a criticism of the ideals, it's a criticism of the narrative approach to market that we've taken on this, right? And so I had actually given a talk a few years back at DWeb uh, camp, uh, and, I, and I said, look, we should stop using the word decentralization because it's this, it's this like, um, 
trying to disrupt the status quo, but it doesn't give us like what happens after that. And so now people will say peer to peer and things like that, which is fine. Um, but it also suggests a topological fix to what I think is not a topological problem. And also the most important thing is that the current big megacorps will absolutely be the best at decentralization. They'll make sure that your edge and fog devices or whatever you want to call them are going to be decentralized and they're going to report right back to the central machines, right, when they have the chance to. So the topology isn't the issue. And if we say decentralization, we're sort of saying the problem is you have a hub and spoke model. So we get, a, get rid of the hub, uh, then somehow we solve everything. We don't at all, right? Instead, what I was arguing at the time was that we should, the North Star approach is say what we actually want is orthogonality of, you know, separation of concerns between really key dimensions, the dimension of data, the dimension of transport, and the dimension of identity. And in fact, everything, almost everything bad about you know, trillion dollar companies centralizing everything and everyone renting identities from providers that have back doors to everybody. The bad thing about that is that someone who wins one part of the stack wins all the rest of it too. It's the collapsing of a three dimensional space of possibilities into a one dimensional monopoly, duopoly sort of stack. So this is a different way of, uh, of framing the discussion you know, as opposed to decentralization, we talk about orthogonality. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, the point of the talk isn't to dive into this part. I could spend an hour just talking about this. Hopefully this intrigues some of you. You, you can come back and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll be happy to. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, I think some of the concepts here are not foreign to people here. And as a bunch of nerds and geeks, you know, the idea of orthogonality hopefully expresses a lot, right? And this is an example of how we talk to a North Star versus being a reaction to what's broken. Um, next is, of course, everyone's favorite topic, privacy, right? And it's, uh, and this is where it gets a little spicy. I remember distinctly in like 93, I was um, chatting with the, the sysop for, for my, my BBS. Uh, I was not actively dialed into the internet from home at the time. I could only get to it from uh, the local university, but I was pretty active in the BBS scene. And so we're going back and forth and, um, and he was really big on PGP and all these kinds of things. And, and so I was trying to ask him at the time, I was like, why do you care about privacy? Wither privacy, right? And he had some things, and I'm like, yeah. And I, granted, I was 15 at the time. I didn't know any better. But I was like, but I'm not a criminal. What do I have to hide, right? So these kinds of things. And over the years, I realized that I really have not heard, and again, I'm a, I'm a physics guy who really wants to get the first principles. I feel like I haven't heard the really, really compelling philosophical argument for privacy that really moves me other than it's my right or anonymity grants us some safety and some other kinds of things. And that's not to say that any of you don't have the answers. I'm just saying I haven't heard ones that I found super compelling. And then it's in the last four or five years where I really started working on decentralized web and what was broken with social media and all these kinds of things that I came to understand, you know what, the reason we need privacy is because it gives us the space to develop our identity. It gives us, so it's not a hiding place, it's a womb. We get the right to tell the social environment we're in who we are and what we are. And we have that agency in that, so a humane social space gives each individual the right and the agency, the sovereignty, to say how they want to show up. And all the super wealthy people in the world get to do this at any party. They can, I mean, assuming they're not super famous, they can choose to reveal how, as, as much or as little of themselves as they want to. They're not forced to walk around with a thing on the forehead saying, I am this person, son of this Rockefeller, worth two point whatever billion dollars. They, they, they can just be whoever they want to be, right? And that ability to show up, to have the right to determine how you show up somewhere, that is an important part of the human experience. That's a deeply human sort of thing. And this is completely independent of the internet. This is just what a humane space is. Um, and so when we go to the internet, which is certainly a substrate for human socialization, we need to carry this forward in that space. Um, and I think this is, again, a concept of a North Star versus a reaction. Like, we're going to hide, sort of like that SNL scale, you put your weed in it. It's like, oh, you've got to hide it. It's not hiding. It's about saying, I have a right to determine self-determination how I want to show up. And any social space that doesn't give me and everyone else that self-determination is not a humane space. So it's not about hiding, it's about a womb. And actually, I have another talk on this as well which talks about how the importance of letting dyads and triads and small groups of people form their own private um, communications is an important way to foster trust, to create sort of a different kind of connection versus everyone just being a mimetic thunderdome yelling sound bites at each other. Um, so this concept, again, is an example of a North Star 
that is a way for us to talk about this. So, uh, oh, here it is. I actually have the slide. Here's the slide, right? Um, so the ability to surface local trust, right? All these kinds of things that is completely lost when we have uh, massive, you know, billion user sort of social media platforms that are broadcast by default. But anyway, these are examples of North Star versus reaction. So then, how do we think about AI? What is the right sort of North Star way to think about what AI can mean for people? That's not just a reaction to, I don't want Microsoft to own all my thoughts. I don't want Google to sell me my waifu, right? Like, what is the actual thing? Um, that was a joke, and no one laughed. <laughs> I have a waifu. I'm very happy with it. Um, so I, um, as, as was mentioned, I've been doing open source for a while. Um, and uh, doing, I've been in the open source space for a while. Uh, and in the last 20 years, I've been very active in the Python community and really watching how the Python language um, got adopted by science and mathematics nerds and engineering nerds, and then we sort of turned that into a set of tools that were really good for numerical computing, uh, and then taking that into data analysis, which then laid the groundwork for modern machine learning and AI. All of that journey has been really interesting, but at the same time, I was a consultant and then a founder of a company, and I also got to see how capital and how business uh, IT purchasing, IT spend, budgeting, how the entire enterprise software market works, um, uh, all of these kinds of things. Uh, watching all that happen, um, again, as a physicist, I want to understand first principles. I want to understand the dynamics. I want to understand the constraints. What are the necessary things? Um, it got me to really recognizing that there's a deep lie at the heart of a lot of the stuff. But first, we'll give everyone a little bit of a history lesson, which is that software as a thing as a piece of intellectual property is a very recent phenomenon. That concept, that mental construct in the game of the world, that software is something you could buy and sell, uh, that you could trademark, that you could copyright, that you could do whatever, that is no older than me. Literally, I was born about the same time as the Copyright Act of 1976. Well, a little bit later, but not, not a lot later. And so this idea that that a pile of code is property, you know, Bill Gates' famous letter to hobbyists, don't steal my shit. Like, all of that um, is a very new concept. And what's interesting is so much money, fortunes and mansions and yachts have been made on the basis of this concept. We put a barrier up around the free exchange of software. We say this is a kind of idea that you have to then go and vend or you can vend, and we put limitations around it. It certainly structures an economic landscape and has made many people rich. But there's a different take on this, right, which now we call open source, historically called free software. Whatever political flavor you choose, FSF versus uh, OSI versus whatever, the point is when we actually allow this thing to run unfettered and to be given away, it becomes extremely, extremely valuable. It becomes, in fact, uh, vastly more innovative, vastly better maintained, vastly more predictable, um, and vastly more accessible. So the fact that when you give this away, and the more you share it, the more valuable it becomes, and the more you partition it and fork it, the less valuable it becomes, this is, for me, proof that it's a new kind of a thing. And it is unproperty. There is not a single thing in the world that we can think of as unproperty. Physical objects are by, by, by human metaphysical sort of understanding, like it's just limited. If you have an apple, I can't have the apple. If you eat it, I can't go and then eat it again, right? If you give me a horse, you no longer have a horse. You don't get two horses when you give me a horse. But if I have an amazing piece of software and I keep it to myself, then I gotta fix all the bugs and some new algorithm comes out, I gotta go implement it. If I give it to 10 different people, all of a sudden, holy shit, I'm way more powerful because now I'm leveraging the resonant thinking of 10 additional brains. So this idea that you have a thing that's not particle-like and atomic and corpuscular, but actually this wave, more like a wave resonance kind of thing, that is a deeply different kind of thing. And um, sometimes when I talk about this, I liken it to, uh, how many people here have not seen Monsters, Inc.? Okay, oh, damn, okay, earmuffs then, if you don't want to spoil. But basically, they extract energy by scaring kids, and the kids' screams give them energy, and then at the end, spoiler alert, last chance at earmuffs, okay, at the end they discover that making kids laugh produces 10 times more energy, 100 times more energy, blows their energy meters up. This is the same thing. It's like, oh yeah, sure, this gets, you know, Paul Allen, $200 billion, or whatever it was, Bill Gates, hundreds of billions of dollars, um, Steve Ballmer, $100 billion, Larry Ellison, however much to ascend to godhood, whatever it is, this makes a lot of people a lot of money, but holy shit, this is what everything's actually built on. 
There's not a single thing you use today, not a single system, not a single anything that isn't built on a lot of open source. So this is a really, really interesting point, and I've gone at length about this because this is a really important thing to center on. It's almost like craziness. Can you imagine going and t going to Sand Hill Road, telling all those VCs, "Hey, giving this stuff away actually produces way more value for humanity," right? So the other thing I came to realize in building and scaling the um, PyData ecosystem is that there's a conversation, there's a piece that's lost in this when we just look at. When you say this is property, therefore it's valuable, it's an apple, it's an orchard, it's a horse, it's a whatever, goose that lays golden eggs, it becomes this boxed and bounded thing and you also just put all the value in the artifact, in the code, like how much, how good is this code? And you completely ignore the human that produced the artifact. You ignore and, and you, you sort of leave behind the people, you defocus off the people that make the thing, when actually the thing is just a residual from the human ideas and from the collaboration of the teams that produce it. And so when you actually watch an open source project evolve over time, as many of you I'm sure are involved in open source and have lived this kind of a journey, the quality of the code, the quality of the ideas, the, the maintainability of the project, all these things are actually intrinsically tied to the quality of the human ecology, the people, the teams that are producing it. So really, software is an artifact of a human ecology the way that honey is the artifact of a bunch of bees. And you can focus on the value and the deliciousness of honey, but, but can you imagine how insane it would be to have an entire world economy, $5 trillion of GDP, international GDP, built around honey, and nobody wants to talk about the fact that bees make the honey. That's insane, right? But this is the truth, that it's actually the amazing thing about software, and I did a, the first time I think I really publicly articulated this was on, a, on my uh, interview with Lex Friedman, and I said, look, what's really hidden, in, in you know, people have a lot of discussions about the, the software's eating the world and the power of software and all this other shit, and it's basically what they lose is that software is even more powerful than that, right? There was a point in time when I could fit all of the core Sci SciPy and NumPy maintainers in a minivan, and the, the amount of daily economic value generated by their open source software is in the billions of dollars a day. So you have a minivan full of human biomass that can generate billions of dollars a day of economic value. Now, if you imagine going back to like King Louis of France and saying, I got a scythe and I got a farmer in a field outside of, outside of Paris, and if he works for one afternoon with this magic scythe, he harvests all of the wheat and grain you will need to feed the entire kingdom for the fucking year. What kind of leverage, what would you do? How many wars would you fight for that sickle, right? And it's like, actually, no, there's actually millions of those sickles. Everyone can have a sickle, just go, go nuts, right? So this idea that actually we can have incredible, unleashing incredible power if we actually allow the human ecology to do its thing and see that technology is of the creative human ecology and not a, a, a thing that's separate from it. Um, so anyway, that then lays the baseline for, again, the theme here is what is the North Star? What do we solve or what are we pushing towards in this world of abund like possible abundance from AI? Now think about the economics of it. And this is something I stole directly from um, Stratechery, from Ben Thompson, uh, and it puts in, in perspective, I think, what this latest technology, LLMs and things, what they represent for humanity. Um, and, and he has this beautiful articulation where he says, you know, in the ancient days, there's this, this idea of propagation value chain, not ancient days, but there's this idea, this, this concept of a value chain for propagating ideas. You have a great idea, how do they get your idea, right? And all of these different steps are bottlenecks that we had to invent technology to scale or to get around. So writing unbundles consumption. I don't have to be around the campfire with you to hear what you had to say. I could read it a year, two years, a thousand years later. And then when we got the printing press, we unbundled duplication. So you didn't have to have a scribe who was literate, tra you know, translate and transcribe these things. We just stamp, stamp, stamp. You could turn mechanical energy into idea propagation and scale. But there's something here that we never really thought was the bottleneck. I mean, you put internet up here too, right? Internet unbundled um, and unblocked distribution at scale. But this idea of substantiation as a bottleneck was not something we'd even thought of as a bottleneck. You know, what do you mean it's a bottleneck? Like, if you have an idea, of course you have to like, actually spit it out. You have to express it somehow. 
I'm a great artist. Well, yeah, show me your painting. Well, I, you know, I haven't drawn it yet, right? I'm a great musician. I haven't actually played the music yet. This idea that substantiation is a bottleneck that could be removed, again, with electricity, with mechanical means, that is stunning. That is truly stunning. And it's also just as a meta thing. Like, look at the right. The invention of writing, the invention of the printing press and the internet, LLMs. That, and even if they hallucinate, even if that's perfect, it's still a stunning thing to be on this ladder, to be here, present, alive, and breathing when this moment flips for humanity. Now, that then really calls into question classic industrial era models of ownership and property. Right? In the same way that we didn't really think too hard about the implications of owning software and what that means to turn into property, if we start just arbitrarily throwing down lines of ownership, lines of control, defining this, that, and the other, then we're going to have a really, really freaking hard time figuring out who owns the upside. Right? Because it's one thing if you say, well, I got a machine, I have the means of production, I own the means of production, your labor that drives the machine, put, 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 and we harvest some wheat, and I get this much, and you get that much, and that's what it is. Okay, fine. But to say that, hey, I have the machine, you go up to it, and it takes your ideas, and spits out all these ideas, and I own the machine, and the upside of these, and you get this, right? We gotta really think about what the implications are by putting industrial era ideas around the separation of property and labor and, and what that really means within our current economic system. It's very possible our current economic system is actually not rich enough to capture or to, to, to put in the right economic um, controls around these things. I do believe in markets. I believe there's value in economic exchange, peaceable economic exchange, but we may be trying to solve a five-dimensional problem with two-dimensional basis vectors, and that's gonna be hard. Uh, yeah, this is just another thing here. Um, the, the thing right now that you might be seeing in the, in the, in the news and in the, in the press is that there's definitely legal uncertainty around LLMs, right? Uh, because you have to compile a bunch of training data, and in some jurisdictions, the mere compilation of data into a collection of data is, makes that actually protected by not copyright, but by database rights. Um, when you go and you apply some Python code to train, to create a set of ones and zeros off of that, are those ones and zeros derivative works or not? There's a question being debated now. Because I know I can write some Python code that turns a pile of work into ones and zeros. Um, that would definitely be considered derivative data. And that's if I just use the zip module from Python, I zip up a bunch of MP4s and MP3s, no one would argue that this thing is not a derivative work. But if I go and apply some PyTorch, vector training, blah, 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 at the end, is it, you know, is it derived work or not? That's a, that's a point of legal contention right now. Um, so there's all this kind of stuff. And the important, really important thing to understand, kind of back to the point about expression and substantiation, LLMs are not copiers, they're not reproducers. So copyright is not even the right framework to be thinking about this because they are idea extractors. We've never had the ability, it would be insane to think that we could extract ideas. Like imagine a book of like, like Shakespeare, like shh, I'm gonna like pensive style like Harry Potter's, like suck the ideas out of here. But we can now, like that's insane that we can. So all of the things that we have, all the tools we have from a legal perspective that govern copying instantly cease to be relevant because this is not copying. This is uncopying. This is unprinting. This is un, uh, uncamera, right? This is like the opposite of the expression process. This is essence extracting. And for an EFF crowd, I'll call back to John Perry Barlow's excellent Selling Wine Without Bottles uh, essay, and he talks about essence, right? This is actually the ability, you have a little, like, almost like a Star Trek style tricorder thing. It's an essence extractor out of any bottle of wine. Now you got a real big problem if your entire economy is built on wine and on bottles, and I can extract the best out of any bottle of Bordeaux or Chardonnay you've got with this essence extractor. And that's what these things are. And even after all of that, at the end of the day, it's not just about copyright is that if you can use these things, you can actually go and synthesize and produce the likeness of anyone um, and, and, and you know, deep fake them and do all these kinds of things and you know, terrible dark things you can imagine that people are doing right now. And this is, um, there's, there's a state level, uh, there's state level uh, laws on the rights of publicity, but there's not a federal um, 
thing right now. And this is the important thing that's interesting because California, of course, really sets the standard on this because they have so many Hollywood actors and actresses who people go and steal their likenesses to sell like pancake mix or something. But, but this is now applying to literally everyone, right? Every parent of every uh, young boy or girl is going to care a lot about this for all sorts of reasons. Because if you have a federal statute on creating the likeness of someone, that's a, that's a big step. And we may need that. Um, so the point here is that until these legal things, and it's like database rights, not just copyright, it's database rights, it's you know, right of publicity, um, unjust enrichment, all these kinds of things, until that's resolved, every single company that's using these models, and, 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 and you know, some of them are like, oh, it's an open source model, doesn't matter. I, I give, give you an open source machine gun, you can still go and kill a bunch of people and you're still liable with it. So here, you can get an open source model with a bunch of training data that's got all sorts of terrible things in it or copyrighted things, you're still liable if you start producing stuff with this, right? So there is a legal gray zone and people are just YOLOing into it right now, but it is definitely not resolved at all in any jurisdiction, at all. So, you know, here's, you have Microsoft saying, oh, <laughs> would you trust a nonprofit or a for-profit? This is when they were arguing, he was arguing, um, against Facebook's open source model in favor of OpenAI's model, which is like 49% owned by Microsoft. So it, 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 the mind boggles. This is prior to the OpenAI board fiasco, but it's just kind of hilarious. Um, so Microsoft finally got the open source religion, I guess, or something. No, they got the nonprofit religion, not even open source. They got the nonprofit religion, because uh, Facebook is a for-profit but released an open source model. Anyway, it's the, I have no words. Uh, just, I have no words. Um, so this is actually my last slide, and this is really the point. I, you know, um, I think that if we have the, such an amazing technology that can unlock the promise, the OG, OG promise of computing for everyone, if we are not able to articulate the positive vision of what that could do, if all we do is react to all the bad stuff that the trillion dollar entities and whatever are going to do to it, we are forever perpetually going to be stuck in the loop of being just outside. It's going to move faster, so have an OODA loop that moves faster. We're not going where the puck is going, we're basically trying to whiff where the puck was. Um, so I think that uh, what I would encourage all of you to do, like you say, well, what, I can, what can I do about this, right? I think the important thing here is number one, recognize what the stakes are, recognize what the possibilities are. Recognize the conversations we should be having about this. How big the stakes actually are. Don't, don't play for peanuts. This is actually really, really big. Um, and, you know, again, I say I was not one of these cypherpunk, cryptopunk, whatever kind of people. Uh, but absolutely, I was really, really into a lot of peer-to-peer -peer technologies back in the day. And, you know, you think about the fact that we really could build, we really have the ability to build small, portable computing that is a, you know, uh, a wisdom upgrade, a knowledge and information upgrade for literally everyone on the planet. We could build it for, for peanuts. We could really build them for peanuts. You think about how small, um, you know, a gumstick Linux box is or a Raspberry Pi. Um, you think about where people are going with like the, the um, quantized smaller, smaller models. You put on a, you know, 128 gig little mini micro SD card and you could just build these things at scale and give them to you don't have to give them to everybody, but you certainly give one to every family. And now you'd have an educational unit, you'd have something that you you train it with just clean data, like, oh, there's all sorts of stuff you could do to unlock this kind of thing for everyone. And you wouldn't ever have to phone that home back to the great Google in the sky. It wouldn't ever have to go back over some, you know, encrypted, you know, elliptic curve encrypted, you know, end to end encrypted thing on some, you know, device we're trolling on the company. Like, you could actually redo and restore the idea of personal computing, the idea of human computing and humane computing, and completely change the economic incentives. Um, so I guess my, maybe the, the, the punchline here is don't let, let's, I, would, I would love to see a world where what happened to open source, where I got hijacked and strip mined um, by, mod, by traditional industrial era economics, I would love to see a world where that didn't happen to what AI could be. And this might be our last chance to actually solve this. So anyway, on that happy note. <laughs> Take questions.
little spicy. You know? I think I will uh, assert current board president privilege and ask you the first question, and then I will go around here. Sure. Um, we can turn the lights on again too, so yeah. you get the. It, just kind of to set the tone, because I think it's a good place to start from where you said. So, how then? How are we going to avoid a scenario where essentially the AI doomers, the Yukowskis of the world, and the uh, self-interested lawmakers who will enable the doomers? How do we prevent them essentially? locking all the potential of AI behind a giant corporate wall garden in the name of it's too dangerous to let ordinary people have this power. Oh, did I ask a tough one? <laughs> no, I'm trying to figure out how deep I want to get into it. So, um, here's what I really think. I really think we will have transhuman intelligence, superhuman intelligence, of some kind of a general reasoning capability within the next several years. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clear to me that's going to happen. Um, and it will not be maybe the classic, uh, what people now think of as AGI, Skynet, whatever kind of thing. But it's going to allow, it's going to augment the intelligence of a human or a group of humans um, at some very, very large scale. It will help them in reasoning and thinking and strategic planning. So that, let's call that AGI zero. And you just... This is actually a long-winded way to answer your question, but I really want to give the right build for this, okay? So, if we're on the brink of building AGI Zero, now, every single government with more than pocket change is trying to build that too. They just don't tell you about it. They don't argue with Yudkowsky. They're just gonna fucking build it, okay? <laughs> um, and the first thing you do, think about this for a second, if you really have, if you can build the, the, the God Oracle, what's the first question you do once you build it? Thinking from a like, national security perspective, no. How do I immediately kill everyone else in the world that's trying to build one of these things? Or stop them? Or confuse them? Basically, how do I be the only one with an A-bomb? Yeah. How can I make sure that I retain my advantage? It's just, it's just prisoner's dilemma. You got a box, you're in a cell, you might be, you get a box, you make one wish. Right? This genie comes out, you get to make one wish, and there's a bunch of other people in other cells that don't like you and that you don't like particularly very much. What's the first thing you're going to do? Well, you're going to hope that you're the first one to get that genie. You're going to say, take all the boxes away from everyone else in every other cell. Right? And maybe you get there, and maybe you don't. If you got the box, chances are you were the first one. Because anyone else who gets the box, prisoners don't know what they're going to do. They're going to make sure you don't get the box. Right? So if I were running one of these dark projects and I was literally given a US level budget, to build something like this, that would be the first thing I would do. I would say identify all the people in the world who are working on projects like this, figure out how to stymie their, their effort. Maybe not actually kill them, but just what does it take to slow all of them down so that they don't get to this level, to AGI zero level. And then I'll do everything else after that, because then I've assured my lead. So I don't need to think about what the next steps look like, because I don't have an AGI. All I have is human thinking about humans in this world. And I'm going to tell you the first thing that any two-bit general is going to think about when they get this kind of thing is how do I stop everyone else from getting it? Okay? That's just how monkeys think. So, given that, now, now if you guys accept that argument roughly as true, what would be the first thing that you would do if you actually had this to play this through in the, in the popular world? You would never say we achieved AGI. You would say, oh my god, we've just proven AGI is impossible. Or, oh man, progress has really plateaued on these things. These, man, these things are just not going to be like, you know, you're going to do all these things to make it not look like there's been an abrupt stop, but you're gonna to try to shovel or shunt people into dead end paths, honey pot, whatever kind of things. That's what you're gonna do. And meanwhile, you're gonna really get in there and make sure that everyone who could build one of these things has a car accident, right? That's really what you would do here in America. So, and I'm not trying to celebrate this, I'm just trying to be realistic about what this actually will, let's be really serious about this, right? From a serious question. So let's talk about Yudkowsky and the Doomers. You would absolutely have those guys go and fuzz the conversation. Um, so that's what you would do. <laughs> wow, if I didn't know better, uh, you just made a potential accusation in Yudkowsky there. <laughs> Not an accusation. I'm just, I'm just trying to like gamecraft this thing. I mean, I think, yeah. so I, what I don't like is people who are playing this as if it was just a schoolyard game of checkers. This is not a schoolyard game of checkers. This is every, you know, even if there's only three or four sovereignties in the world that can do this, which I don't think is true. These things are not that hard to build. But, and that, that actually might be my natural follow-up to what you said is, okay, if, assuming I'm this general and I'm not, like, 
dumb, and ostensibly I got to be the general because I am really smart, this stuff is really easy to replicate, and it's just going to get easier and easier over time. It, like, ordinary people, because of, like, you know, pre-trained models, ordinary people don't need a lot of computing power to access this stuff. That's I can right. really actually see how you can kill everyone who might do it. <laughs> That's right. So that is the optimistic view on this, which is that because we're so lucky, um, this is almost a, 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 a weak anthropocentric optimism, because we're so lucky to live in a universe where the physics are such that we can use silicon circuits to replicate some sort of cognitive things that replicate that are similar to what we do in our brains. We're so lucky that these things are cheap, easy, we just plug them in, and they don't require some exotic unobtainium. Uh, unobtainium. It's just matrix multiplies. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. Um, so given that you can't stop it, then what do you do? Right? Because if you could stop it, if it was required, uh, I just saw Oppenheimer finally this weekend with my son, and you know they were talking about, well, the Soviets can't do it because they can't get the uranium. It's like, oh no, they got the uranium. You know, if it was actually something where you needed this much uranium, or if it was like, oh well, Iran has you know all these uh, centrifuges. Well, it'd be a shame if those centrifuges broke, right? Just break the centrifuges. But we don't have that with AI. You just need to be able to do matrix multiplies. You can do it on three-year-old, you know, crappy laptops, and it's fine. So we are maybe you know everyone if we just get them to recognize that this is not something you can stop, then they would sort of lean into well, how do we make sure that the post AGI world actually evolves in a way that doesn't lead to instant sort of collapse to fascism in every single country, right? Um, and so that's an easier problem to solve than one power having the power of cognitive power of gods and everyone else being kind of held at arm's length, you know. We just have to solve that everybody's a little mini god. Yeah. <laughs> we got to become better. All right, with that, who else wants to have a question? Yeah, you. I've got several actually, but uh, on the back of that question, it made me think: Are there any lessons that can be drawn from how did that not happen with DARPANET becoming ARPANET becoming us all in this room? How did that not happen to that chain of events? And is there anything we can draw from that in this? How did process? what specifically not happen to it? Well, how did? It, it easily, there were moments where it easily could have not become the open internet, it easily could have not become open standards and DNS and all of us sitting in this room, it could have become um, top-down authoritarian command and control structures and that was, that could have been the end of it and it could have taken three or four more decades before it became open just by dint of ubiquity. I, I don't know, I just, I was wondering if you think... Well, it started, op it started pretty open, right? It, yeah, and then and then wasn't for, and then you know. And now it there. isn't. I mean, I, I would say we're 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 not through it. Yeah. We're you know it isn't. Yeah. So I mean. No, that's true. Although <laughs> to that end, it is interesting that originally, because of dialing into terminals to mainframes, it with cloud computing, we're almost going back to that model in a weird way, sort of. No, we 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 are, um, and, it, and it's not bandwidth scarcity; it's economic control. Right, um, and I don't. And when I say these words, I just to be clear. For me, um, for me, it's all around the emergent. What happens when you incent a lot of people to do certain things? I don't think there's some shady dude be pulling weird things behind a curtain uh, because there cannot be. It's such a large emergent system. It's just that we've shaped the dynamics of it such that the emergent system locks in a certain kind of crappiness. Um, and, well, I mean, Cora Doctor probably would have talked about the shittification. The shittification is emergent, right? It's because we're shitty. And so you put a bunch of us together and we emerge shittiness. But, uh, and, and to not do that, we have to look to our better angels. We have to actually consistently fight and intelligently fight for the pieces of architecture, for the power moves that, 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 that eliminate that. And so I think there's a, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know where I was going with that exactly. But I do think the internet actually ended up in a pretty dark and kind of crappy place. Um, if you try to set up your own SMTP server, I mean, I don't want to rehash all these arguments in this room, but try to set up your own SMTP server and get reliable delivery to anybody at Gmail. Good luck. Call me back in three months, right? The few people um, I know who do that get marked as spam all the dang time. And that is not an accident <laughs> in the sense that, oh, back to this crap, if we'd actually solved, not with Passport.net, but if we'd actually solved this problem in some robust way, and we had actually had that conversation in the articulate in the in the concept of this articulation, so we've got to understand what scalable what 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 um, a spectrum of social identity actually meant, and what it meant to create humane spaces in a digital way where people could reveal as much or as little of themselves. Then it wouldn't have been this polarized maximalist. No, it's all anons on 4chan, or no, everyone must have a biometric retinal scan to connect 
you know, to fucking ICP and ICMP or something, right? It, it, those are not the right, those are not the answers. We have to be better people to become digital humans. And I guess maybe that's sort of the essence of all this, which I don't hear a lot of discussion around in general in these concepts. It's like, oh, we're flat, we're, we're just, you know, fleshware, meat and bones, and wetware, and want to connect with this digital thing. And it's like, no, actually, for us to emerge collective wisdom in a, in a digital way, we have to become better digital humans. And think about the synthesis of these things, which requires us to actually think very, very in a very principled way about sociology and human socialization and individual psychology. And we didn't do any of that shit when we just went and stacked protocols together, right? So, so we end up with where we are. You know, it's our own fault. And I really just have to say that I really do like where you did finally emerge on privacy because it actually <laughs> is very close to what I sometimes articulate in a lot of my talks, where I basically say like. Privacy is what lets society fix the places literally in the social code we got it wrong. You know, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of mistakes throughout human history. We only fix because people could meet in private and say, you know what, I don't think this is right. And they could change those social norms without instantly getting slapped down. And yeah, it's, it's a, a, a society that has the concept of privacy ultimately has humility about what is and is not within what a top-down kind of social thing can do. So anyway, that's that's. So, a, yes, I really like where you've been on that. Right. We got some more questions. Yeah, a room full of smart people. Yeah. Uh, Peter, did you tell me you were in Cambridge recently for Aaron's Sports Day? Yes. And what, what's no, no, no. I was not in Cambridge for it. I was, I was, <laughs> on a golf resort, uh, dialed into it, okay. but it was not of my choosing. I went there because they gave me an award, so I had to go there. But what are the lessons of Aaron Sports to you? Right? What kind of inspiration does he do for you? Well. <laughs> He got hounded by the feds for one millionth, for one millionth of the infraction of any of these things. Makes me angry is what it does. Makes I think most of us in this room pretty angry. And yeah, actually, I had never seen anybody contextualize his act compared to gathering this data. The articles he took from MIT, a fraction of what they've stolen. Yeah. On a principle basis, on a what he was trying to do basis, on an intent basis, on an outcome basis, on an any kind of basis, making scientific literature available to the world, if that's a crime, then you have a bad society and you have a bad political system. Full stop. Full fucking stop. And then, ten years later, to have this shit get rewarded with trillion dollar valuations in the public markets is a world that really does not give a shit. And so people like the people in rooms like this have to just look at it with a cold, cold, steely eye and say, okay, well, this guy is going to make more money than this whole room combined, president of Microsoft, and he's out there saying this shit with a straight face to a room that doesn't throw eggs at him and laugh him off the stage. I mean, he got a little bit of shit on Twitter, but whatever, everyone gets shit on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but this stuff, seriously, though. Right? Every single day you see somebody raising a bunch of money off of whatever model, I encourage you, go click through, look at the trading data. If any of them mention any of like common crawl, any of the other shit, it's a bunch of Fortran crap, it's a bunch of like other stuff, copyrighted stuff, it's a bunch of bad stuff in there. None of them, none of them are clean. Anyway, sorry, you no, no. triggered that, you, you asked me. Well, I think, as I said, I, I think most of us feel pretty similar. And I'll also just say that anybody who wants to, uh, fight to keep the legacy of uh, Aaron Schwartz alive, um, and you know, and frankly, what's now also happened to Reddit it just makes the whole situation even worse. But um, I'll say certainly uh, the person who's at least carrying on the spirit of his act process, protest at MIT, do anything you can to support the work of Alexandria Albakian, who just won an EFF Pioneer Award. She, with Sina, she's continuing his mission to make the science yep. of the world. All right, we have some more questions. That was an incredible talk. We got to have more questions. There we go. <laughs> Are you familiar with uh, Representative Ryokana from Silicon Valley? So I have I have seen uh, I've seen their work, but I I, I don't I don't know personally. Well, just he wrote a, a book called uh, Dignity in a Digital Age: Making Tech Work for All of Us, and I think he's been thinking about this. Okay. Stuff. Yeah. So just, okay. I. So yeah. I hope you get a chance to check him out. Sometime. All right, I, I will. Let him know what you're working on. If you've got some okay. ideas, I think. No, can... I, I I mean. Um, he's in the, like, the extended network of people I know, but I'm, I've never interacted with them directly. Okay. But yeah, okay. I will make a note of that. Thank you. I just got a chance to meet him at the Texas Tribune at the end of September. He was in town, and I was pretty impressed. Great. No, so to be clear, I'm a dilettante in all matters, even coding. Like, I you know, don't have much formal training. These are just ideas of mine that I just, from my observation, yeah. and I don't claim 
unique originality, whatever. I mean, the originality that I did come up with some of these ideas for myself, but not trying to claim like, oh my God, I'm the only person saying this at all. I'm just sort of, yeah, that's, but it's, I would love to meet other people. If you guys have recommendations of things I should look at or people I should engage with, I'd love to get that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Do you have any ideas about how to like solve the economic alignment issue of ten open source developers creating ten million dollars of value and a bunch of private companies capturing that? <laughs> That's another talk. I guess. Um, <laughs> um, no, the you know the the topic of open source sustainability is something that has been. Well, it's kind of fallen, fallen off a little bit. It's not the current thing anymore, but certainly for a number of years, it was uh, talked about quite a bit, right? Um, uh, and the economic problem I have had, actually the good fortune um, in the last six months or so to do a lot more reading uh, and some of the fundamental free market thinkers and some of these other kinds of folks. And what I've um, come to realize is that it's not, you, you just won't win if you're in the wrong frame. And the problem is almost all of the economic thought we have in the world today is based on the scarce, the interchange of scarce goods and resources. And um, there's, a, there's a great book by, I forget the name, uh, MIT Press, I think, um, Specialization in Trade, right? All economics is rooted in specialization in trade. And when you have this, and, and you trade for the purposes of having comparative advantage and all this other kind of stuff. But, but with the, um, Unproperty, what do you do? There's like not a lot of economic theory around this. The closest you get is actually, that's why I pointed this stuff earlier, like the, uh, Eleanor Olstrom and the Commons, how do we express you know, this kind of a thing? Um, and there's no build in the current economic order to think about how we allot surplus, how, we, uh, you know, how do we allot these things when there's that much upside from collaboration? So um, you go from, like in physics, you talk about, oh, we model the quantum energy in a bounded, you know, particle of bounded infinite well. Well, what happens if there's no well? What if there's just like fucking energy could just flow everywhere and you get more of it the more it flowed? I don't know how you saw, there's no boundary constraints, right? So this is, there's just not, I'm not seeing a lot of thinking in this regard because most of the people who wrote about this crap like were in the age of like ox carts. It was not, they never had this idea that you could have this incredibly powerful thing that the more you gave of it, the more valuable it got. So unfortunately, where you end up getting to, if you have to actually get a real practical answer, is you get to things like cooperatives. You get to things like meeting people's needs. You know, How do we pull together our ability to go to market? Because these tools, you do have to still go to market with them. But the problem is there's no intrinsic way, given the software has already been um, expressed in this basis of property uh, and trademarks and, and, and copyright and all these things, it's really hard to, 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 to keep it from escaping out right, and keep it from getting strip mined. And so there's only so much you could do around that. But with AI, maybe a different thing is possible, right? That's kind of what I like to explore. I wonder if, you know, I love your emphasis on articulating positive vision, um, you know, in the form of a North Star as opposed to just constantly reacting to the, your bad situations. And uh, I wonder if you've worked with the idea of seniors. Brian Eno's idea of, of scene scaled up, genius people in a scene scaled up means something, hmm. you have an emergent level quality of work. So if you imagine what it's like during the high middle ages when there, when there are universities around the year 1200, right, it's right. going to turn into the renaissance. Some of those people knew it. So you, know, you had a situation a few generations later where a person from outside of the elites, Leonardo da Vinci, if I remember correctly, was not from a wealthy family at all. I think his, his dad didn't marry his mother. But the system had enough seniors to recognize that guy's individual genius. If it had been 200 years earlier, he might have just been a local artist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, have you worked with that idea of seniors at all? Um, this is my first time hearing about it. But if I'm understanding the way you're describing it, um, I have expressed that concept myself um, when I was arguing for why, uh, ages ago, um, the power of open source, and really the internet. It's really the internet, but once, even before we had GitHub, you still had mail lists and websites and things like that where people could engage, and the people who actually moved the open source projects that are the core of SciPy and NumPy and things like that, people who moved those projects forward came from all sorts of backgrounds, right? And that was a really, even though I've been in the Linux community for a long time, and you know, was a um, diligent slash daughter, if that <laughs> is a thing, and freshmeat.net and all these things, um, it, it, you didn't get a sense of it until you really were active in a community and you're on the mail list and interacting with people and you're like, oh my God, this person is like 
a high school kid from like India, and they have like great ideas. They're contributing to a very technical project. Um, and if you do that enough times, you start realizing, man, we are very lucky that genius is just spread everywhere. And so if we really care about not losing those grains of genius right through our fingers, then we should be building systems that get all those people connected, give them the opportunity and the space and the right scenes to elevate their performance, to elevate and to do whatever. So I think that's, that's the, the, the moral spirit at the heart of this, right? Um, yeah. Amen. <laughs> Preach it. question about orthogonality, but when I heard the one from the back row, I just remember that I thought I had heard a rumor that your talk was going to be about, like back in the summer, that's going to be kind of about credit assignment or something. Oh! I think it's maybe like something, or you know, alignment, credit assignment. Um, I like the concept of logical depth, like, hey, you know, we have this thing that's like got a lot of computing and knowledge and things wrapped up into it and somebody puts a thin layer on top and makes all the money and nobody else got any. You know? um, yes, so that is um, that is a little bit sorry, let me um, different talk. Uh, yeah, let me pull that up just to give you this very point out, ladies and gentlemen. Well <laughs> uh, well he called me out on having heard the rumor here. Um, and it is a one of these two. Let me see which one is. Um, my idea around this was um, so. Let me turn on this again. Screen mirroring. But you were very big on this in the spring when you and I met at that party. Yes. Um, and uh, but I but but this is such a. Um, it's a. Hold on. Did it? Oh my god. Enjoying Microsoft PowerPoint? No, not now. Um, literally not now. Um, and so the idea here is that, um, oh my god, what just happened? You haven't paid enough fealty to 365. Yeah, I somehow ended up off of the thing here. And the idea here is, look, um, so if everyone can build LMs and build AI models and build AI applications, um, my, 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 my push at the time, and still is something that I'm trying to develop, is the idea that commercialization of LMs will require solving the attribution problem. This is kind of the thing you're asking about. And it will not rest solely on the question, it will not be decided solely on the question of copyright versus fair use. And we'll need a holistic licensing model that actually credits both the data, the code, and the training efforts around this. Um, and so I was proposing the idea of a new concept, a concept of a new license for AI. And license, this is a little controversial. Some people don't like it. Some people don't like the idea of using the license mechanism. But I think we have to start for any kind of a new legal development. We we sort of have to maybe back up and start with at least contract law and a permissions-based thing and, and signaling intent. Um, so um, you know, my pitch at the time as well, and continues to be the point I make, is that there's many, many, many powerful people on both sides of the argument. The argument for fair use, and I can train off anything, and um, no, it's all owned by the copyright, existing copyright holders. So these people are basically locked in, heated battle, um, and they all know that this is gonna be for all, they're playing for all the marbles, right? Whoever wins this is gonna get all the marbles. So entire industries, Hollywood, gaming, I mean, you name it. Um, and so um, you also can't govern LLMs in a very simple way because they fit on the USB stick. So. Um, if we don't do anything, my argument was going to be that we end up with essentially um, some result like Author Skills versus Google, where the big AI companies will negotiate bespoke uh, licenses with the big copyright holders. Everyone else is in the legal gray zone where you know intellectual ventures or something can come around and just snipe you. Um, but if you want to actually be an ML researcher, AI researcher, you almost for certain have to play within the, the Microsoft, Disney, Sony, blah, 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 whatever walled garden. Um, that is a possible outcome. And then all the open source, all the various other kinds of things, they're just all in this legal gray zone. Yes, John? Is that kind of like Napster leading into streaming services? Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's exactly that, that concept. And the Napster leading into streaming services is kind of funny, right? Because the Spotify was one of the big, uh, I mean, was the big um, lead of that. And it started from basically they were making, you know, uTorrent or whatever. And then they just got too big and too successful. And they're like, wait, let's negotiate a deal. 
because we're so good at distributing music, right? Um, and so, um, so yeah, that, that's the point here, that we'll end up with essentially de facto licensing cartels, uh, and everyone else outside of that gets arbitrarily sniped by whoever, whatever patent troll wants to go after them or copyright troll. Um, so, um, my, uh, so this idea of a um, um, license, so let me stop this one, and then go to this one that has a bit more of a build as to what that license looks like, um, which is here. Um, wait, where the heck is it? Um, sorry that this is such a mess, but uh, just trying to respond in real time to uh, an example of, oh. Um, this one, I think this is the one here. Um, nails. So here it is. Okay. So um, you see here. So the idea um, was to build something like a ML public license that has it's a, like like the Creative Commons. It's a set of um, it's a license family. Uh, that are compatible with each other, that kind of build up in different levels. And the key concept here is that we run ahead of legal, settled legal jurisprudence or whatever, or, or, or any kind of settled case law. And what we do is we give authors and creators of any form, a speech, text, uh, you know, whatever, video, we give them ways to assert their intent, to signal their preference of how their stuff gets used. Um, and so essentially the same way that if you write an essay or a book, you would say copyright by, you know, Joe Schmo 2023, you'd also say um, the use of the contents here, I assert that I'm the human author of the contents contained within, and the use of these, use of this content for training LLMs or whatever kind of, you know, deep learning models, ConvNets, we'll have some term in there. But the use of this for any kind of a deep learning machine learning model is governed by the terms stated here. Nice little URL short link, you click it, it takes you to the author's page with a lot of, basically it's like a registry clearinghouse, right? Almost like the way that a, you know, ISBN or something would be. And it gives you the author's intent for that work. Now again, no legal teeth to it whatsoever, but if millions of authors and creatives do this, if Stephen Hawking does this, if Taylor Swift does this, then you start, Grimes does this, you start doing this kind of thing and you end up with something that is um, a groundswell grassroots movement that when the Copyright Office goes to issue their next statement on generative AI, they can't ignore that this many people have stated what they want to have done with this, right? They don't live in a world of ignorance anymore. And the really other th interesting thing about this is that we would actually build, we, we take a line from the GPL and make this viral, right? So that um, anything that trains off of this data corpus it, that, that, that LLM model itself must be licensed under a no, uh, you know, no less restrictive license. It has than to this be a copyleft license. It's a copyleft sort of license, right? So you build this alternative third path with remuneration built in. Any, a flexible system for this that's machine parsable, so you can build data collaborative data unions that assemble corpora. And so if you're a nonprofit researcher, you're like, give me the data I can use for training this kind of thing. And you can go grab all the stuff that's allowed for, that's like CC by, uh, CC by SANC or something, right? Non-commercial. Um, and so like, uh, this would be the, the concept, is to build essentially a viral, but not copy left, but a viral, um, structure that has remuneration built in, um, that has, that expresses what creators want. And the really interesting thing about this as well is that let's say that you have text or you have some like, let's say I have a Jupyter Notebook that you know, tells people how to, how to learn you know, machine learning with Python. But in it, I may have code blocks that are generated by LLMs. Part of what this attribution, part of what this kind of information can do is also provide metadata to say which parts of the data set were actually human authorship and which actually were LLM generated, and even more, what versions of what LLMs generated those things. And this actually is a very useful thing for any AI developer, because then you avoid model cannibalism, where your LLM is trained on the outputs of some other LLM, and you didn't know, it's like a dog eating another dog's poop, and also your dog gets sick, right? So that's where another valuable thing of this is, that I can not only assert and attest human authorship, but also clearly de delineate, demarcate you know, the provenance of the other elements that were used to generate this thing. So you can also build in some NFT stuff if you're, you know, NFT uh, 
friendly and Web3 friendly and whatnot, but it's not an integral part of the story, but it's something you could do if you wanted a uh, you know, non-central banking fiat currency based way of doing this kind of thing in places that actually are difficult to bank, right? Because we want a system, we want a global system of data registry and data management that doesn't exclude the remuneration possibilities for people living in countries that are not on the SWIFT whatever I'm on system. Um, and I think that, of course, because it's unlikely that any particular LLM researcher is going to negotiate the rights of a million different pieces of training content, what will almost Im immediately emerge from this is the concept of data unions, data cooperatives, and places like the Internet Archive, places like Wikimedia, Wikipedia, will end up being clearing houses for this kind of thing. And they will actually go and maybe put some, um, I don't know if affidavit's the right term, but they would put some uh, attestation about the quality of particular corpus and uh, corpora data releases so on and so forth. I mean, you sort of see how all this is playing out. But the idea here is to build an alternative economic architecture. And this actually sort of answers the question from the gentleman in the back about how you know, open source got strip mined. This would prevent the strip mining because it actually builds a way of building a composable economic system into it. Do, so, you, do you see this eventually progressing to similar to how like, we now have like, web servers right now is to have robust TXP to assert the web server's desires to a search engine crawler? Mm -hmm. Essentially, websites will literally have similar metadata to a big data crawler of, no, yep. you may not scrape me for the model, mm -hmm. basically, and eventually you actually, you, anybody exactly. who violates that is, there's now a legal case, because, yep. well, they asserted their stuff and you didn't listen to it. Or you can yeah. build with the website. And that one, that, one's a, even, that, like yeah, and that one is a little bit of a hairy issue because there are archival purposes where it's useful to scrape and things like that. And that's where the robots at TXT well, thing is unfortunate, right? You get like organizations like Facebook trying to block academic research scraping. So yep. it, it gets more complicated. It gets more complicated. Yes. There's other builds on this, and not builds, but there's some other thinking around this that goes deeper. But this is the this is the the, the kind of the radical idea. Um, and then you start with this, and so the really, truly radical thing is if you say, well, what if I wasn't just licensing my uh, essay or my book of poetry or my art? What if I literally just put this to my entire data exhaust? Every post on Twitter licensed with this thing. Every single Facebook post I post. Every single picture I take with my phone gets this watermark in the exif. Every biometric thing you read off of me from Apple Health. Every single piece of my digital wake is now actually part of this kind of a scheme. What you've now done is blown up the business models of trillion dollar companies. Facebook's entire database digital twin version of all its users, those users would have an ability to assert their ownership of that model. They could now have just now, used all our pictures to train their model, which they did. They which they did, <laughs> which they did, right? So this is, the, this is the shit. I mean, if you really wanna talk about the Molotov cocktail, or if you wanna talk about the the sort of the uh, Guy Fox moment, this is what you would do, is you would push these kinds of data privacy, um, the, uh, the, the digital likeness or the you know, right of publicity kinds of things. You would go and create a grassroots viral movement around this kind of thing, and, um, and you're off to the races. And then I, I think the third question is how then we get like say creatives on board with that this is the answer, not just like pushing the strength in old broken copyright. That's models. just a grassroots movement to basically catalyzed the entire world of creative, I don't know, you know, it's a non-linear sort of knock-on effect, right, it's chain reaction. Think about this though, Taylor Swift re-recorded her entire catalog because she didn't like the deal her record company cut, right. right? It's a deeply non-linear effect that you could trigger. Are there any legal minds that you know of that are like working on this, like kind of operational? Well, I've talked to some of them about this and they, they seem to think that this basically, you know, kind of holds water and you just have to, just have to do it. And I think, you know, this ties into, um, I know a question I got, uh, you know, from the audience um, that somebody was also just wondering, I think it ties into their question, was just sort of like, okay, so we have this positive vision, but yeah, like, what are the practical steps all of us who care about this in this space as activists can take to really push this vision? How do we get out of the current dystopia we are in with AI and seem to, you know, like, the momentum is still with the open AIs and Microsoft's mm -hmm. and Metas and Googles of the world, like, what is the actual path to getting us this beautiful AI empowers the individual future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I, you know, I've done some thinking about this. And uh, at the end of the day, money talks. Right? We still live in a system where power is either through the economic system or through kinetics. We don't want to go to the kinetic route, generally. Um, I don't think anyone here is empowered to win that at scale. But certainly the economic thing, given that um, you know, ultimately, the people that are pushing the larger centralized solutions, they're driven by economics as well. They don't, I don't think people are really hoping for dystopia at scale. They just 
think it'll be harmless for there to be another trillion dollar company around AI. And my thinking is that actually it could be quite harmful to have that kind of thing. And, if, and not just that, but we have the opportunity to give, you know, I, this maybe gets back to like, um, to, to, Tesla, to Nikola Tesla's idea of free energy for everyone. Like that would have been pretty cool. <laughs> like free cognition for everyone, that's pretty cool. And also a way for us to sort of restore our human, hum, human dignity and sovereignty, that's pretty cool. So, um, you know. As far as the, the, is the ownership of knowledge in perpetuity, I mean, is that the assumption that, that's being made here? The ownership of knowledge in perpetuity? Yeah, is that, is that if, if they're arguing over who owns the information, do they own it forever? Is that, because like, even patents and all have a limited duration, so it's... All default models include a default, all default, all default licensing models include a time-based expiration to the commons. I'm approaching this from philosophy, and I don't know enough about this topic to, to provide any solutions, to say the least. But uh, sometimes uh, you can uh, expose a couple of contacts to know each other to uh, outline some context. So, in the case of privacy, the term that goes with privacy is exposure. Mm -hmm. The whole concern about privacy is to avoid exposure. The other fun fact in our class is to do with Alan Ramoska, who dealt with the tragedy of the commons source. What she did was uh, dealt with a lot of small groups <coughs> that were highly dependent on one another and had a sense of shame with respect to one another. Yep. In those particular communities, they did not have a problem with the tragedy of the commons. Right. Elsewise, they did. Yeah. So the two comments I would, the two responses to those two different separate things. Um, you said, I think, uh, I want to make sure I get this right that um, around privacy, the point of privacy is to, is to avoid exposure, yes. right? And I would say that that's almost what I'm saying, but not quite, that it's actually to give individuals control over how much they want to expose themselves. Sure, that's right. That's but, but that's not just to avoid exposure. That again, see, if we just say that it's to avoid exposure, it's like you gotta hide your weed in it. It's like, no, it's not about hiding anything. It's I get to say how I wanna show up. I teleport into this place. I get to show. I get to show up wearing whatever, however I want to be, be seen by people, right? So it's that agency in a in a social context, and the, so I'm not really disagreeing. I'm just sort of saying, you know, a little clarification on that. The second thing, relative to the tragedy of the commons and how small groups that had social governance mechanisms, let's say, like shame, things like that, they didn't have a tragedy of the commons, right? That was Olstrom's observation. Um, and the reason that they don't in those situations is they actually have to break down how does that shame mechanism work? What does it mean to be a small group? You have large groups actually which don't have tragedy of the commons. What you need is for people to have persistent identity, to care about their social identity in the context of that socialization, to be able to, um, every person, there has to be a causal link. If this person pees in the pool, all of us have to swim in somebody's you know, P, like you have to be able to trace the causality. So if you're in an environment where the consequence of actions are too far in the future or too muddied to be able to disentangle and say that person did that bad thing, therefore bad on them, then you don't have that. Um, you don't have the mechanism, right? That corrective mechanism, the shame mechanism. And if you don't have the ability to remember even who was here, like you don't have identity and persistent social identity, then, then you have a utter defector problem, right? People come in, they'll do something bad, they'll leave, they'll take the money and they're gone. And so, in all these, when we say small groups, shame is a governor against the tragedy of the commons. The reason is because all these different, you have to break down what is meant by small. And, and, right, and the way I think about it as a physicist is what are the components, what are the traits, what are the core principles that cause people to not have to have external things, but actually within the context of that socialization, have self-governance. And so that's kind of how I break that down into pieces. Mm -hmm. We have a little more time for questions. Uh, uh, is symmetric orthogonalization closure for open asymmetrical information warfare? Yeah, you have to explain that to me a little bit more. Um, there's a concept, uh, a theory of asymmetric information that the sellers have more information mm -hmm. and it's valuable. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the words open and closed system and asymmetric warfare in the militariz militarization 
mm -hmm. uh, with information warfare. So I'm seeing a, a attention dilation with memory for the privacy aspect mm -hmm. of having a exposure and a with the womb being attuned without a view. That's why I'm, I'm asking is symmetric organization closure for open asymmetrical information warfare. Um, and I think I would, so my answer to that would go to, um, can you start with the privacy and identity thing? The only, I, I think it's pretty, pretty well, um, it's pretty well established that the way you solve the prisoner's dilemma is through iteration. Right, and you do incremental sort of iterated prisoner's dilemma, and so what is what happens with each iteration of the prisoner's dilemma in an iterated prisoner's dilemma thing is that you each each prisoner is building a social model of the other prisoner, you know, and we're all doing this like we're humans are the apex predators on this planet. Every single one of us, if we were actually psychopathic murderers, any one of us could do a lot of harm to everyone in the room. Right? Every single millisecond that one of you does not whip out an axe and start cutting people is an instance of iterated prisoner's dilemma playing out in this room that we all can trust that we're not murderous psychopaths. Right? So in every situation, when you have asymmetric information right, and, and like that, it, you have to be able to strip away enough of the privacy or give, you have to give enough of yourself to show what you're going to do under this circumstance. You're essentially showing, you know, you're proving, you're putting social proof on the table that you're not a defector. At the end of the day, that's all you can really do. Um, anything that we put in through technology to remove the ability for us to retain memory about who we're dealing with is then an attack, an erosion on that fundamental mechanism for a good market for a social exchange. Right? Maybe a way to think about that. So I don't know if that actually answers your question, but I think that's, I mean, that's my response to your question. I don't know if that um, really answered it. but. Thank you. I'm trying to get with the concepts of your orth and gallantry, and mm -hmm. that's where I, the symmetry. Uh, that's oh where no, the orthogonality there is generally defense against capture, right? And to be very clear about what I mean with capture here, um, to to put this into concrete terms, so um, well, so like we'll just take this iPhone, right? Gosh, it's just the worst example of all of them. <laughs> um, it basically classes all of these things. And so for me, like if I communicate with, yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to sort of, um, like if I had a separate device that I could encrypt my data on, and I copy the encrypted bits to my transmittal device, then it doesn't matter who I use as my ISP or my transfer agent, they can't really read what's in there, and they can't therefore um, own or, or leverage their, even as a monopoly on that, they can't leverage that into, oh, you know what, the, 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 the bit rate for the data that's this website is different than the bit rate for the data for this website. Or you just won't be able to go to those websites or stream these video services, right? The idea of common carriage is essentially uh, an attempt to, to create some orthogonality between the bits versus the content, right? The, the carriage of bits versus the content. Um, but that's entirely a commercial concept. It's driven by, by commerce and by economic concerns uh, and, and antitrust concerns. This is really more along, it's like what kind of engineering or software architecture, or really, I guess, tech architecture, ensures this in a fundamental way. And we didn't get here with TCP IP. We didn't get here with web servers. We didn't get here with the current uh, internet stack, which is why things are collapsed and why one, one uh, like a Verizon, oh, one example I give of this is the Verizon Super Cookie. You guys remember that, the Verizon Super Cookie? where they were secretly putting a x dash whatever cookie in every single web request or header in the, in the, in the web request that was a unique ID tied to that Verizon subscriber. <laughs> you guys didn't hear about that shit? That's awesome shit. That was some awesome shit. And that is a, that's what happens when your data protocols, which is the website content, the HTML, gets, it is injectable, it's not SSL encrypted, it's injectable by your transport agent, right? This is a small example.
And I think, you know, you originally brought those slides up in the context of that just decentralization in and of itself is not a cure-all, right? Well, so for instance, you know, we, you know, mind you, I'm, I'm boosting, you know, Mastodon and Lemmy, I'm stinging their virtues, but the truth is, in and of themselves, they may not solve the issues of a Twitter and a centralized social media with bad content moderation. You could have something exactly like what happened with email, where it's like, in theory, you can have endless email servers. They're all run by a few companies, a lot of them Google, and they mark anybody running their own as spam. If it she turns into there's just five Mastodon servers and they mark all the tiny ones, they block and defederate from them. Same problem. The same problem. Yeah. Are you optimistic about homomorphic encryption for uh, means of preserving privacy? For instance, like, I mean, there's a huge penalty you take. You take like a quarter of magnitude computational penalty right now. But it does allow you to do some things like run private data through proprietary models. Yeah. I think it could be the baseline for some interesting technologies that would be more orthogonal like this. The problem is if you were to make, if you were to put that capability and build it into the framework, if Tim Cook was just the most golden hearted person in the world and declared, uh, and they, I mean Apple to their credit has tried to do a lot of these kinds of things to some extent, but but if, if he, if we were to actually put that on here, but the social pressure around all the teenage girls with iPhones was to they take pictures and take nudes yeah. of themselves, it doesn't matter, I, right? I guess I'm talking more like Kind of outside of if we're to a better a thing where these uh, you know transport and identity and stuff are more uh, decoupled. I mean, it's right. going to a more optimistic. It could no, ab absolutely that that could help. But I, I, I again, I really mean that. I don't mean that in a like, dismiss, dismissive way. I mean, I really do think having more encryption could be a good thing. Um, I think I think that somehow if we get if we could separate the transport of data from like right now people think of the internet as a topology. Uh, uh, it literally is a series of tubes, and we gotta be jacked into the tubes. Um, and I don't even know what it would quite take to get people out of that mentality about being connected to the, the, the thought space, the new sphere of humanity. If we could change that paradigm, the tech we have already right now is good enough to do that, right? Um, and so that moving from constantly connected from when the cable modems first started rolling out across America back in the late 90s. If we can get people off that paradigm of I need to connect to this web server, give them all my shit, let this JavaScript scrape all my mouse cursor movements. If we get people out of that mentality, um, that would be, the, uh, we'd have to create new kinds of computer devices, interfaces, and, you know, we'd have to basically create new ways and things, ways of thinking about computing and what computers do for us that then don't put humans being the connected thing. And that's my, actually my, my positive, um, vision for what AI could do for us is that we could have smaller, dumber agents that have some sense of who we are and what we want and our preferences, but they then negotiate with others, and then their interaction with the constant connected thing is not uh, is not revealing anything about who we are, um, and and so on and so forth. And that moving to us being the center of a bunch of agents that then defend our privacy, uh, that would be the architecture that would then allow humans to sever themselves from what the constantly connected, plugged in, jacked in internet uh, does to human socialization. So basically a little drone sphere of angels hovering around you. Absolutely. <laughs> Rendering you invisible and unknowable to the Panopticon, right? I mean, this is what in, in, um, uh, in Diamond Age, right? They're walking out of little nanobot swarms to kind of protect them from various things. Yeah, maybe it's that. Uh, yeah. which is actually Probably beyond your presentation today, but I'm just curious your opinion on this. So, um, what we are experiencing these days is like this revolution that AI is, is going through. Is that there is there's an ocean of data out there that human civilization aggregated or accumulated, and we have an extremely efficient method now to extract information from the ocean of data compressing, integrated in a very clever way. Uh, however, this, this knowledge that AI generates today is going to be part of that ocean. It's going to be recycled, right? So if the next generation of AI will use this as data, so in a way we are recycling information. So will we ever exhaust the resources of information in this way? 
Uh, um, and I, I assume we would, unless there is there is guarantee that there is new information coming in, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Well, that's that's actually. I I think that's that's science probably that brings new information or exploration, human exploration. But it's a kind of very narrow <laughs> uh, uh, source. It's so it's right. Uh, so I see, you know, I see AI is being a lot more aggressive than and aggressive in a way to recycle the information that we have than than this this new sources of information that we can we can utilize. Um, I, I don't know, and I may not make Sense, no, it makes total sense. The question makes total sense. And there's a term that people use for this general phenomena of um, right now, LLMs are generally trained on large corpus, corpora of, 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 uh, of data. And um, uh, they are all terrified of this, what they call model cannibalism problem, like I described earlier. Um, now, there's some sites that expressly forbid people from posting LLM generated content as responses or whatever, but, you know, they, they never know. Right, um, and so absolutely, you know, uh, there's a there's a, a fair trade in the world um, of people diving these like wrecks and getting steel from ships that were sunk before like the first atom bomb, because they don't have certain radioisotopes, they don't have certain, and they use them in manufacture of specific medical devices or sensitive instruments that uh, they don't want them sending off any kind of radiation. Right, so the pre 2002 text corpus, or actually maybe pre, whenever GPTs really start becoming popular, I mean obviously it's gone on the hockey stick, but you know, even prior to chat GPT, the, the, the machine generated content was a problem. You, GANs and other things were creating content and they were trying to optimize SEO things for you know, Google scrapers. So, um, so this has been a problem people talk about for a while, model cannibalism. Now the problem is it's going to really explode. right? So, um, so I have lots of responses to what you said, and they're not going to be in any particular order, but I'll just kind of throw it all out at you and hopefully make something of it. Um, on the topic of this model cannibalism, several things are also happening at the same time. People are trying to figure out new architectures, not even transformer architectures, but, but new architectures for doing what transformers do with embeddings, um, and those may allow for this current level of generative AI performance without having to consume so much. So the ingest funnel is not so wide, so big. You can actually do a lot with less. And that would allow you to avoid some of this cannibalism problem because you just don't need to suck everything in, right? That's one concept of the thing that's there. Another comment I'll make is that for the things, for things like art and whatnot, as long as humans have some creativity, they're gonna bring the human creative element into making this art thing do whatever. It'll be contextualized based on whatever music was popular, whatever event just happened, or whatever thing, right? Um, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to information and sciences, and we'll discover anything new, or will we just stuck as like the machine regurgitating itself and recycling, right, all these things? That, it, my answer to that is actually something much more deeply philosophical. And again, going back to John Perry Bar Barlow, uh, where he says that, uh, and this is based on, you know, Greg Bates and stuff, that information is a verb. So we talk about data as a static thing, information is a static thing, knowledge is a static thing. Again, it's almost like looking at software as a static thing. And we ignore the brain that's doing the informationing, the group of people that are doing the discovering. Um, so, so I think the, um, the way I look at it is looking at humans getting smarter, humans exploring, humans intuiting as a process. And so the question is, is that pro can that process get smarter and better? Will it ever be limited because we can't think beyond just what the machine that helps us you know, is doing? Um, and that... You know, I, I don't, so I view it from that perspective, right? This is an assistant to help us think better, explore, research. And so I'm not as worried about the, the wake, the exhaust of, uh, of static artifacts that might be left in the wake. Um, so I, I don't know if this is maybe too philosophical of an answer or response to that, but, but that's kind of how I think about it. So I'm not as worried about that part of it um, because I think of, you know, you could really, 
um, absolutely see a future where very much like, you know, uh, just going to all the science fiction shit, I guess, you know, whether it's a bunch of Cylons, like now plugged in or we're just Borgs or whatever, but you can see humans entering into fugue states with these kinds of things and being able to sort of form almost a hive mind exploring whatever kind of things. And there may be a lot of time and room left for human intuition, human embodied experience in the world to reflect into that well before those things transcend into beyond, you know, transhuman levels of sensory experience and intuition. So I'm not saying it will never happen, but I'm just saying I'm not worried really about the data catalyzm or the model catalyzm in any kind of short time, time in the near future. Yeah. We're, we're really into time, but we've got any one or two final questions for Peter. It's fine if we don't. We've certainly achieved a lot already. Uh, yeah. Well, my other question is just, when you sort of came into this orthogonality concept, did you go down the rabbit hole and think about how it applies to, I don't know, politics, economics, biology? Did you find anybody that was thinking about it in those domains? I was really just nerding out on D-Web <laughs> and internet architecture. This actually came out of, um, uh, um, what was it? Well, I can't search for lightning talk because I give a lot of those things. Um, um, I, I gave a, a, oh, 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 here it is. So this is the one where I really, um, this is actually from December 2016, whenever it was, and, um, no, January 2017, and I was giving a talk about, I was invited to give a, um, a lightning talk at this unconference that happened at the Institute for the Future. And um, so part of it, everyone's like, wait, what just happened? The Trump thing and all this and truth and all these things. Anyway, so this decided to give a two-part sort of uh, uh, one-two. And the second part was this humane network concept. And this is where I really started developing these ideas and go down a rat hole on all this stuff. Um, and so this is where, you know, um, this is where this kind of stuff comes in and it's like a stack of pile of fail, um, problems at every level, other failures, all these things. Um, and fundamentally, th you know, so you sort of see some of this articulation come out. This is before I joined the CHT board, before I really started working and talking to like Tristan Harris and Aza, before I wrote up some of my things and thinking about this, this is before I invested in what became Beaker, I'm uh, sorry, Beaker Browser, which then became Blue Sky. This is, you know, prior to all this sort of the seminal moment, as I was trying to understand what really happened here, right, in creating kind of the, the, the outcomes. Um, and so this is where I define my thought about what a humane network looks like, um, that actually it's against the end-to-end -end nature of the internet. It goes the other way. That in a humane network, the trust is a scarce resource, and in a humane network, a trusted connection is actually the signal. It is not actually common care, which is the exact opposite of that effect. Um, so anyway, so this is where all this stuff came in. And thinking more on this, you know, a couple years later, kind of is where I hit upon the expression of orthogonality as a way to preserve and ensure that some of this stuff actually connects. So. I may actually uh, take privilege of final question because you're talking about the orthogonality uh, actually kind of having me think about saying, so like, you know, I, I think that's a very intriguing idea of like, orthogonality as a way to break these systems apart and make them more robust and get out of this purely topological way of thinking. I can't help but notice though that orthogonality in higher multi-dimensional space is literally at the core of machine learning. Have you, has there been, you, I don't, I have not spoken about this, I'm sure not the first person to think of this, but like, has there, have you thought maybe about like using the machine learning models to not just find the weights, but actually figure out what the optimal parameters are, what the orthogonality itself should be? For anything, but, but for the but for well, the, I mean, hyperparameter optimization is a whole topic. It's a rich topic, right? Okay, I don't um, hear it talk about very much, but as I said I knew I couldn't be the first person. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's a thing. But the the um, in higher dimensional space, this is the the, the 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 thing about higher dimensional spaces and vector spaces is that in higher dimensions, almost all vectors are orthogonal. Right, uh, true. pretty much because there's just it's a lot of dimensions, just right? Just pure probability they're going to be orthogonal. Yeah, right, right. Um, there's a lot of counterintuitive things about higher spaces. Uh, you know, volumes exceeding area, like it's all or what is this surface area exceeding? No, there's like there's a really cool video. Of, who was it that did this? Where they showed the intuitions about spheres and lines, intersections, and all these things completely just fall apart because you can define n sphere in n-dimensional space, 
and it doesn't do what you think it does. Like it's just really, really weird. So we don't have an intuition on that. We barely can intuit 4D space. You know, we're talking right. 100 billion parameter space. We have no idea. But I guess you had to focus the question just sort of like, is there maybe the potential to apply these machine learning techniques to sort of figure out what the orthogonal parts of our computer architecture should be, like where we should be separating these pieces. Like I think your three part division is a pretty good place to start, but it kind of gets me thinking like, well, we've been hung up on these topologies and we keep uh, chasing the same decentralization dream that doesn't work out. Is there like a fundamentally different way of breaking apart the architecture that we could literally throw these models on? It is possible, it is absolutely possible we can use um, use ML techniques and AI techniques to help us architect better things like this. Um, but you still then have the problem how you you move from here to there, right? You don't start with nothing. Right. Um, well, you still need data as well. Say what? You still need data as well. You know? Yep. You need, I don't think it's rocket science thing about what we should do to establish this kind of stuff. It's just nobody wants to do it because everyone's making trillions of dollars. <laughs> everyone's 401ks is on the blue chip companies that does do this. So we just like, oh, whatever. Um, um, so yeah, I, I think the hard part is how you move out of a, one loop that works really well and do a discontinuous nonlinear leap to something vastly better. We have a moment in time where, it, where we could have that kind of a change and the only way we leap to that future versus an incremental sh and shitty future is, is people have to actually go and create that, that, that alternative. Um, yeah. Get on it, everybody. Hey, get on it, yeah. All right, and with that, I want to thank Peter for an incredible talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time.